thank you for coming here today. Um, today I'm going to talk about stream processing in Python, what are the uh, motivation to actually use stream processing, and when you are in the business of building stream processing pipelines, what are the options there, and what are the cons and pros of each architecture decision. And then I'm going to talk about open source library quick streams, which is one way of um, processing data uh, real time in Python. And after that, I'm just going to go to Visual Studio Code and show you a bit of that in practice, so theory and practice, building um, a quick stream analytics um, um, here on the stage. So let me introduce myself. I'm Thomas Neubauer. I'm CTO and co-founder of Quicks. And um, before, before Quicks, um, I was building stream processing pipelines in motorsport in F1. And uh, this is where I kind of um, get into a gap in Python for stream processing, uh, because all the people that wanted to leverage the data that are they were flowing in Kafka from cars, uh, were using Python, mechanical engineers, aero engineers in general, and uh, ML engineers in, in McLaren uh, really didn't want to use Java, and, um, and all they wanted is a nice Python API. And because it was really a huge amount of data, um, we struggled a lot, despite successfully connecting Kafka to the telemetry on the track. So this is where I kind of get the idea uh, that um, you know there's nothing really to use. So, so I understand my audience. Can I ask you who is using pandas on a regular fashion? Okay, and who is using Kafka in their job? Or okay, fine. So, stream processing, as everything, is not a silver bullet. So you need to have a reason to use it. And uh, let's dos discuss the differences between kind of a database-centric architecture versus streaming. So let's say that you have our project that we're going to build together today. You're analyzing clickstream uh, data from a website. Imagine a newspaper website, and you want to see where people hovering their mouse. Um, if you would use batch, you will just gather this data and save it to a database. And then you would have some batch job that would, every five minutes, every hour, every day, load the data, analyze it, and put it back to a different table where, the, where would you query it from your application, uh, whatever that is, any sort of visualization. In streaming, though, that's a bit different. So you're sending data into a pipeline, which then is consumed by your processing service. And that could be a microservice, that could be a stream processing framework, or an engine, which we're going to discuss in a second. And then you push the results back to another topic. So basically, now your core of the architecture is not a database anymore, it's a broker. And broker was made to scale, and that's the difference. So it's not just that you're getting better latency, because obviously, the data flowing to your pipeline, there's no batch where you're losing the time. It's also scalability, durability, and fault tolerance that you're getting um, out of box. And then obviously you're pushing the result to your front end application or dashboard or whatever you're using to consume this data. Um, so what your project needs to, what requirements you need to kind of decide to go for stream processing. There are three major reasons. So the number one is when the amount of data that you're getting is huge. That was the case in F1. We were ingesting 30 million numerical values per minute per car. Um, so basically, database simply couldn't handle um, that ingestion. Um, and in that case, what you probably want to do is some sort of pre-processing before you land it to your database. So you strip out the stuff you don't need, you normalize data, you convert the schema to what your database likes. So imagine we had binary protobuf to save it to influx. In our case, we just convert it to a nice line protocol format. You might want to join data or actually split data. Depends on the use case. Sometimes you want to downsample data because you don't need the original granularity of your data in database long term. 
uh, but you might want to use it for a real-time animal detection. So you work with a different quality of your data uh, based on if it's real-time or batch. The second reason is when you need to react fast. And I mean seconds, possibly minutes, not hours or days. Um, again, that was the case in our project. We needed a second-grade decision-making um, to, to, to send the car to the, to the pit. And it's the same bit here. So if you need to react to data fast, that's your reason to, to go for stream processing. The third reason might be, because obviously what I'm going to show you today is all around Kafka and distributed com compute. And um, if your particular importance on a fault tolerance and durability of your system, uh, this is also the reason. When, you, uh, when simply an API-driven um, microservice architecture is not enough because losing a request somewhere between two microservices is unacceptable. Now, you can tick one. If you tick more, even better. Um, so let's say that you answer yourself that stream processing is what you need. Then what you can do, there's basically two major ways how you can approach this. You can either use client libraries of whatever broker you choose and use one of them and build it with microservices consuming from topics and producing to topics. It has its cons and pros. Um, or you can adopt stream processing engine like Fling or Spark Streaming or others, which uh, will just get data from Kafka and do the compute and data processing completely on its own. So the first option is quite elegant, lightweight. You have well-supported client libraries of, from Kafka, from, from Red Panda, from Pulsar. That's all great. And you probably find your language uh, if it's sort of a mainstream language. And it's relatively simple up to the moment when you move from a stateless processing or sometimes called one and a one and a time, one and a message at a time processing into stateful processing, because suddenly you go from okay-ish uh, experience to a very difficult computer science uh, problem, and at that po moment you might be tempted to switch to something like Flink or Spark streaming. Simply, simply put it, a stream processing engine. Uh, those Engines are quite old, like Fling or Spark. They have all these stateful operations already built in. So that's great. And they are all fault tolerant, um, correct, and durable. But um, there are a couple of issues with this decision. So the first issue is that uh, you immediately increase in the complexity of your architecture by deploying something else that's going to run the code. So you have Kubernetes and something else on the side. And you don't really run the code in your IDE. So you're just orchestrating something else that's going to run the code. And as a result, you know, forget about putting a breakpoint on a line 25 and checking your state and your variables and go line by line using profiler. These developer perks are just not there. Because what you're basically doing is you're registering a code that you send to an engine. An engine would redistribute the data and code and state accordingly. The second problem is that even though you have PyFling and PySpark, they are just thin veneer of Python around Java. And you will feel it immediately. Java stack traces, jar files everywhere. Uh, but you have to try to kind of um, to, to understand uh, the pain of the, the jar files. And then talking to third party technologies, when you're using something like Fling or Spark, you have to build a connector in their framework, which is not the case with the option one. With the option one, you just build Python um, microservice that uh, using the client library of the technology, and then you add one liner to push the message to the topic. So it's a huge difference in, OK, I found this new database. I found this new data source, and I want to have it in my pipeline. Uh, so. Uh, that's another difference. Cool. So quick streams. 
Um, this is basically our attempt to go with option one, but solve all the stateful processing under the hood. So basically, when you, when you are in, in process of building this microservice that's subscribing to Topic and doing all of these uh, operations, today we don't have time to discuss this in detail, but there's a lot of checkpointing, state management, uh, basically to working with the fact that you have multiple timestamps and multiple rows in one message, making sure that your state will not get corrupted and the data will not get accumulated twice. And what we have done is package all of that in a familiar API, which I'm going to show you today, which is a data frame API. So the idea here is that you work with data as they would be in your Jupyter notebook loaded from database. But they are, of course, not. They are just flowing to your service, um, and they're getting processed the moment they arrived. But the muscle memory of working in batch is, um, is there. So that's the idea. Cool. So let me show you this um, in, in action. Yeah. So here, I go to Quick Spot Form. Mm. Let me just, yeah, I just going to mirror my screen. Yeah, good. So here we have the QuickStream Analytics example. So if I open a website with just a simple example of e-commerce application, and I hover around the phone. This is, this is basically the result of the pipeline I want to build today with you. So you, the people moving around the mouse on certain pages, and you can observe real time in the last five minutes where the most people looked with their mouse cursor, uh, what articles were interested. So if I now start to moving to, oh, sorry, to a different pace, it would just be starting to, yeah, you see. All right, so how we can build this? So first, I'm going to go to back to platform, and I will switch to environment dev, which is looking to a different branch. This is a DPT model to CI CD um, uh, of these pipelines. So each environment looked to one um, branch. So here we have the WebSocket ingestion. It's a microservice in Python that this website is pushing data into. And here I have the first microservice, which I'm not going to build today, which is taking the mouse coordinates and converting it into a tile tile grid, 10 by 10, 50 by 50, you name it. And I just want to show you here, because this microservice is super simple. It has 30 lines of code. Look at this. Uh, make, make, make me, let me make it bigger. Um, so look at these two lines. Um, so here, I'm calculating new column in a stream. But actually, what I'm doing here is I'm telling this library that every time you receive the message, which looks like something like this, um, it's a big problem with the zoom, but this is how the message looks like. It's just a JSON, OK? But what you're doing here is that um, I'm saying to the quick streams, every time you see such a message, please calculate this stuff and add it to the message. So it's not happening when I run the code. It's happening when the message arrives. But the result is the same. So if you would do it in a batch and uh, wait and one hour for all the messages to run through, then the result will be the same. And so we are using this in another microservice, which I'm running here in my Visual Studio code, which is called Heatmap Aggregator, which is empty. And here, what we're going to do, and again, uh, this is too small. Um, Zoom in. So what we're going to do here is we're going to build a hopping window of five minutes where we're going to count number of visitors for each tile in a stateful service. So let's do that. So first, we have checked here uh, in messages um, how it looks like. And I think what we need is just a relative path. 
so we don't mix different pages between each other. And then we're going to need the tile coordinates. Um, so what I'm going to do is just do a simple column projection. So you do uh, tile coordinates and relative path. So I'm going to get these two columns, and I'm just going to run it, Python 3 main PI. And then I will go here to pipeline and just open this and make it a bit smaller so you can see how I'm doing it. All right, so if I start uh, here, now you see at the bottom that I am at the, quant at the six and seven tile in the root of the website. Great. So now I'm going to go buy this data because I want basically aggregate every tile. So I'm going to do following thing, SDF dot goodbye. And here, because we basically have in a message what we want for grouping by, I'm just going to do this. And I'm going to give it a group by name. And then um, I'm going to use a hopping window. So the hopping window is window of the duration that's hop at a predefined step. So I'm going to use time delta five minutes. So we are interested in a five minute long aggregation. And I'm going to use step of one second. So every second, we're going to get the aggregation so we can see what's happening. And I'm going to use also a graceful period of one second, because sometimes some people might be using poor internet, and we, want to, we don't want to miss that messages uh, as well. And then I'm just going to do count and um, final. Good. Uh, I think I have one extra. One ex no, I have two time datas here. Good. Um, so that should be it. Let's run it again. And if I go to here, and I'll start on this price for the Samsung phone, if you can see it. Um, you see now, if I just gonna start moving there, I have already visited this 31 times between six and seven, okay? Now, if I stop this service, I would not be using this library. Either I would have to implement the stateful monstrosity under the hood, or uh, I use something like this. And as a result, if I go back here and start moving around this, around this number, it would start from the previous previous number. So if I go here, you see 76 already. So under the hood, we do all the checkpointing, we manage the state, and then when you deploy it to our platform, we attach the PVC in Kubernetes, and we have a change of topics under the hood to make sure that the data in the state are not corrupt. All of that is basically the secret sauce of this open source library. Uh, package in this easy to use thing. So now when I dis deploy this new microservice, it's just a dbt style approach. You commit into Git what you have changed, and then uh, here you just synchronize that branch to your environment. And, and so this is how you use quick streams. And um, I don't have the time, unfortunately, to kind of explain the, the more, but um, yeah, you can give it a try, and I will just show you the GitHub link. Uh, give it a try if you want. Give us a star if you want to support us, and um, it's as easy as just pip install, quick streams, and then you just need a broker. You can use any broker, Red Panda. We have now local Red Panda Docker Compose in our CLI as well. Um, and today we are doing a meetup uh, in some up offices on evening. So if you're interested, uh, come come to join us. Um, it's uh, on evening. Uh, it's very close uh, from here. So thank you very much for coming here today. And if you have any questions, while well, I'm here all day, um, and yeah, give it a try. <laughs>